Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays here and 4Ks. And today I am talking about a couple of 80s classics uh, in the horror genre, the horror comedy genre, basically both uh, cult films, one of which is uh, from the great Stephen King, the mind of the great Stephen King, and the other uh, from the equally great mind of Mr. Fred Decker. Um, and uh, we'll start with Silver Bullet. This is a 4K. This is from Scream Factory. You are getting a 4K and a Blu-ray with this, and I'll go into those details shortly. But for those that don't know, um, this is a story that was... Basically, Stephen King was pitched on the idea of a calendar where they would have an artist illustrating, I guess, the deaths of people from this werewolf, and he would write a story or a partial story for each month. So each month you'd have a picture of the death uh, and a story to go with it, and it was called Cycle of the Werewolf. It was like a novelette, I guess is what it's called. And he would go on to adapt it into a different for sort of story, uh, more expanded story for the screenplay that he wrote for Dino De, De Laurentiis, who um, had just worked with King on Cat's Eye and who was very interested in um, adapting King's work and just generally working with him. Uh, so yeah, this is the story of, I think the town is called Tarker's Grove and it is a very small community. There is a local church that is a big sort of, um, touchstone for the community. The priest there is played by Everett McGill. Um, but, uh, the idea is that this town is suddenly beset with some horrible murders and, at first, people are concerned that it's like the work of some kind of a maniac. And soon uh, it becomes clear to a select few in the community, um, especially a young boy um, named Marty, um, that this could be the work of a werewolf. Uh, but then it becomes difficult for the townsfolk to be convinced of that. Um, so it's sort of a they won't believe me kind of horror story in some sense. Uh, but it's got a lot of interesting characters and a lot of great character actors. Uh, it has some really great effects by the um, sort of world-renowned special effects guy Carlo Rambaldi, who I think is most known for creating E.T., the actual creature of E.T., but you know, had worked on uh, Alien, King Kong, Possession. Uh, I love that he worked on Possession. Uh, Conan, uh, The Destroyer, Never Ending Story. He worked on Dune as a creature creator, King Kong Lives. And uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting werewolf costume that he designed. It's, I think, maybe, I, and I'm not sure, the commentaries have sort of a conflicting viewpoint as to who... Um, maybe didn't like the costume as much if it was the director Daniel Adius or if it was Dino De Laurentiis uh, because the way the costume is shot in the film is well, uh, very stylishly I will say but it also is sort of not showing it um, very much until maybe very late in the film and so we're getting like glimpses of the werewolf costume in a dark shadowy context or shots of the werewolf's eyes things like that, and uh, so it's unclear to me whether or not the they were trying to hide the costume or how they felt about it, but I at least think it's interesting, you know, like, just like the difference between the American werewolf and London werewolf versus the howling werewolf, I mean, I guess I'm fine with werewolves not all looking the same. Now, this one, maybe he looks a little bit more like a thin bear or something like that. I don't know exactly how to describe what this werewolf looks like, but he is scary. And one thing I will say is that this film for me, A, is one of my favorite Stephen King related films, but also one of my favorite werewolf films. And it was a movie that 
really scared me as a kid. It came out and maybe I saw it just at the right time. Uh, and one thing I didn't mention is that the Marty character is handicapped and that adds to the suspense of the film. He is in a wheelchair and so he seems a bit more vulnerable to a werewolf attack than even a regular kid who could at least attempt to run away. Uh, but another thing that always drew me to this film was that there's a great relationship between the Marty Corey Haim character and his uncle Red, played by Gary Busey. And one of the things I love about this movie is that it has this certain dynamic by, between those two that it's it's a really neat dynamic. Uh, the Uncle Red character, played by Gary Busey, is an alcoholic. He's very much struggling, but he loves the Marty character. And unlike Marty's mother, who sees him as something of an invalid, um, the Gary Busey, Uncle Red character sees him as a very strong kid, which he is, and does really nice things for him, uh, including building him this really incredible motorized wheelchair that's like almost like a go-kart. Uh, that goes really fast, and it has like racing stripes. It looks like a little motorcycle, and I think as a kid, that was always a sort of a selling point for the movie for me. Was like this kid riding around in his souped-up wheelchair, just like such a cool idea, such a cool gadget, if you will. But yeah, the the film is really an interesting like who done it at first because it's like people are dying, and it's unclear if the werewolf is an outsider or somebody from the town and then it seems to be clear that maybe is somebody from the town and I'm not going to spoil who that is but there are some scenes eventually where the um, werewolf is revealed to be uh, who, who it is and, and how how it's, it's dealt with is pretty neat but it's I think it's a good example of Stephen King storytelling characters dialogue um, the kind of town this is, it all feels very Stephen King to me, like just in terms of the adaptation, obviously he's doing it himself, but I think it's a really great example of his work and what is so interesting about it and compelling about it. And like characters often being very mean to each other. I think that must've been some part of Stephen King's growing up is witnessing some extremely mean <laughs> things between siblings, between bullies and between friends. Um, so fascinating stuff. But anyway, getting back to the Gary Busey character. Um, one of the things I love about certain character dynamics is the idea that certain characters are clearly not expendable in a film. Like the Corey Haim character, probably not going to die in this movie. And I think it might have been Tarantino that w talked about this, guy, this character in particular as something that works dramatically in terms of tension is the idea that the Uncle Red character, and not going to give away what happens either, um, could die. Like he's the kind of character that you really come to care about, but he is on the fringes of being potentially expendable. And so in that level, you're just always like, oh man, the werewolf could totally kill him. And that would be perfectly in line with this movie and the sort of downbeat nature of it. You know, will he make it through the movie is the question. And so I kind of love that dynamic. And you'll sometimes see it in other movies. Certain characters are they're kind of the equivalent of an Uncle Red. But I think this movie really does a great job of making him so sympathetic and so compelling that you really root for him, but you also know that he could potentially be, uh, again, expendable. So I think that's really neat. Um, I also think his character is similar to a character he played in the movie Straight Time, where he and Dustin Hoffman meet up after Dustin Hoffman gets out of jail, and they um, clearly have worked together before, I think, but he gets him to do um, drive for a, a, a heist that he's trying to work on. Um, and there's something about that character, it's like Red is almost like if that character didn't have kids, because in the movie in Straight Time he's married and has a little kid, played by his own kid, um, but they they have a similar warmth with youngsters, I think. Um, but yeah, Gary Busey is just like one of the sweetest, you know, uncle characters in a movie. But also the kind of guy that, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night with a bottle of wild turkey on the bedside table. Um, anyway, I really um, enjoy that character a lot. But 
Uh, we should talk about the rest of this cast because the cast is really remarkable. Uh, like I said, Gary Busey, Everett McGill, um, Megan Follows plays the older sister. She's very good. Corey Haim. Terry, Qu- Terry O'Quinn is the sheriff in town. Uh, he's very good. Um, let's see here. Lawrence Tierney from Reservoir Dogs is like the local saloon owner who has this really cool bat called the Peacemaker that he brings out uh, on occasion. Um, I'm trying to think. The movie opens with a really great James Gannon you know, just a really quick scene of him. Uh, there's a bunch of familiar faces in here, even some that I don't know the names of, but I recognize the people. So it's very cool in that sense. Um, in terms of the features, this uh, doesn't have much in the way of new features, except it has a new commentary with uh, Scott Wampler and Eric Vespi of the King Cast, which is a podcast for the Fangoria uh, network. And they talk about Stephen King uh, exclusively there. Um, It's a really enjoyable chat and it covers various topics, but definitely angling on the side of the Stephen King aspects of the the story. And especially the differences between and additions to the screenplay that Stephen King wrote based on the novelette cycle, the werewolf. Um, I still think it's really funny. It was pitched as a calendar and that that's what that was. Um, and the Dino was like, we need to make this into a movie. And uh, yeah, so that's fascinating to me. But, um, you know, it's a good track, even if they disagree about some of the behind the scenes stuff. Like, again, the details about was it Dino De Laurentiis or Daniel Adius that didn't like the, the werewolf design and wanted to hide it? Um, I don't know, but it's it's uh, it's a cool stuff. Vespi also calls out that this film has some very similar beats to Jaws. And I don't know how I didn't really spot that before, but just as he was saying it a few scenes later, there's a scene where a, a parent shames the sheriff for the death of his child. Um, very much like Brody gets shamed for the death of the kid in uh, jaws. Anyway, there's more beats than that that are similar, but I thought that was fascinating. There's also uh, some discussion of Don Coscarelli and his experience almost making this film and then not making it. Uh, so that's, pretty cool too but that's the new track that is available on the 4k and the blu-ray uh but we have some older three other commentaries we have one with producer martha de Laurentiis. then we have a producer or, i'm sorry director commentary with daniel adius which is really neat a very thoughtful guy who hasn't made a lot of movies outside of this um but it's fascinating to hear uh michael felcher moderate and talk to him about his involvement with this project and why he was drawn to it and things like him not being a big horror fan. I always find that amusing when somebody makes a pretty good horror movie and you find out they're not actually really a fan of horror movies, but that he said he was drawn more to the idea of a family dealing with a child with a disability, a handicapped child and, and how that dynamic worked. And it's true that I think that's another reason I was drawn to this film is it's not like you don't see a lot of films like this. There aren't a lot of films that deal with this kind of family dynamic, especially when you bring the uncle red alcoholic character into it. Um, who again, very supportive, but his mother, I'm assuming the sister, um, are that they really have this combative relationship that is, and adding to all this family tension on top of this werewolf story, which I think is fascinating. And again, I love that it's a mystery story too. So that's very cool. Um, but yeah, so that commentary is there. And then an isolated score selections and audio interview commentary with composer Jay Chataway, who also I think did the score to Maniac and a very interesting composer. Um, so that's cool. So you have four total commentaries for this. Again, you get a, you get the 4K and the Blu-ray. The 4K I think only includes the commentaries and not there's a group of featurettes that are included on the Blu-ray. These are ported over from the old Scream Factory Blu-ray, but um, you have uh, one called A Little Private Justice, which is about 11, but 12 minutes, and it's an interview with actor Ken Broadhurst. Um, he he um, talks about his character and, um, you know, just a general uh, motivations and things like that. Um 
There's something called Cutting to the Bone, which is about 16 and a half minutes, and that's an interview with editor Daniel Lowenthal. And he is, uh, I think he's very reverent about Silver Bullet, like saying that it's probably saved his career, but he talks about what led him to the film. I guess he used to work on adult films and worked on Mother's Day um, and the Friday the 13th, the final chapter. And anyway, uh, there, there is also a story about Dino De Laurentiis um, not being pleased with the werewolf at, at first. So that may verify that side of things. And I guess De, De Laurentiis brought in a zoologist on set to decipher whether it was possible or not that this could be, I don't know, that story was kind of nuts, but seemingly in line with maybe how Dino could have been at that time. Uh, something called The Wolf Within, which is about 16 and a half minutes, 16, 15, which is an interview with actor Everett McGill. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on that one, but I, I guess this originally appeared on the Umbrella Entertainment Australian Blu-ray from 2018. Um yeah, I'm, I'll just leave that alone. Full Moon Fever, The Effects of Silver Bullet, 21 Minutes, an interview with special effects artist Matthew Mungle and Michael McCracken. Um, this is also from, I guess, originally the Australian Blu-ray. Um, but it's a fun look back at the making of the movie from the effects point of view. Uh, and they, they, it's a twofer. Basically, they're seated together, sort of talking to each other, bouncing off one, each other, one another. And they are... Um, I guess they both work, worked on Ice Pirates, which I thought was interesting. So that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it for this package and everything you're getting in it. But uh, the new transfer is a 2023 transfer from the original camera negative in Dolby Vision. Uh, it doesn't mention HDR. Um, so I'm not sure if it has HDR. I will say my setup is not necessarily ideal because I sometimes don't know if I have my color cranked up too much, but I did notice while the grain and the light and in general, the color is very strong in this transfer. I did notice that especially indoors, uh, the skin tones were a little bit reddish for my viewing. Um, and again, I don't know if I just have something a little too cranked up. But I did notice that multiple times in multiple scenes. So um, you may want to check out some other reviews and see if that's something consistent with their experience or if it's just a one-off that I happen to have. But regardless, um, you know, it's beautiful widescreen. And I love that even when I first got this movie on DVD, I was so used to seeing it, you know, pan and scan uh, 4x3 that to see it in widescreen is just really a beautiful thing. So anyway... That is Silver Bullet on 4K from Scream Factory. And then we have The Monster Squad. Silver Bullet from 1985. Uh, the Monster Squad from 1987, directed by Fred Decker. Uh, I believe his second film after Night of the Creeps. One of the, maybe the first screenplay for Shane Black, who would go on to do Lethal Weapon and um, just become a real phenomenon uh, in terms of... Um, some of my favorite movies, I mean, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Nice Guys and, uh, you know, the, the Predator movie, the newest one, he and Fred Decker worked together on that. Anyway, they knew each other, Fred Decker and Shane did, and hearing Fred tell it, it sounds like he kind of nudged Shane in the direction of writing a screenplay, and apparently Shane was working on this screenplay while Fred was finishing up Night of the Creeps. Basically, he had sold it as the idea was the the little rascals meet the universal monsters, which is kind of what this movie is. It's about um, a group of kids who, when Dracula, Count Dracula returns to Earth, uh, accompanied by Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and the Gill Man, um, they are all looking for this powerful amulet that will grant them the power to rule the world, and... The only people that can stop them is this group of kids led by uh, actor Andre Gower and his um, band that they come to be known as the Monster Squad. Um, anyway, it's a super fun movie. It's uh, Although Fred doesn't necessarily agree, I think it is a, a cult movie, but 
on the highest possible tier. Like it's, it's, it's a classic really. Uh, it's become something of a movie that has a greater, um, sort of awareness now. I know this has been a great gateway movie for many people and their kids. And it's just a, it's a lot of fun. It's very eighties. It has a lot of energy. Um, I, I've, I've always been a fan of it, you know, since I was a kid and, uh, it's been neat to see it finally get a Blu-ray and now this 4k, and this is a really nice 4k cause it's actually a multi-disc set. So you get, it's a three disc, I think. Yeah. So you're getting both the 4k and the Blu-ray and you're also getting a full Blu-ray of Wolfman's Got Nards, which is a documentary that Andre Gower thought was a co-director on but may have been the actual just director of that is a really nice tribute to an observation and study of the fandom of the monster squad um but yeah this has just got a lot of classic stuff in it you know a bunch of kids trying to fight monsters with a really great great climax it's you know it's a it's a really delightful film and i'm a big fan of fred decker as a filmmaker in general he only officially made like I think three features, Night of the Creeps, this, and Robocop 3. But um, I find interesting things in all his films. I'm especially fond of Night of the Creeps and and this film. I, I just am really excited this is getting this 4K release. And as I said, it's it's a really nice package and in including all that stuff. So what we have here is we have the Wolfman's Got Nards documentary from 2018, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, you have an audio commentary by Fred Decker and his cinematographer, Bradford May, which is really solid. A lot of cool stuff in there. Um, you know, little Easter eggs about certain shots and general discussion of um, the production, which Decker, I think, he was pretty young. I want to say he was like 27 when he made this movie. Like, you see the behind the scenes, he looks so young. Um, it's so neat to see his enthusiasm directing the children. There's a couple of great scenes where he's directing the little girl and you get to see the direction of that. And I, I really enjoy that stuff. But, um, yeah, so he, the film was produced by Peter Hyams, who I'm a big fan of a producer director in his own right, you know, made things like busting and outland and, um, tons of great and interesting films. But I think, from what I gather from the commentary, Hyams was a little, maybe tiny bit nervous about Fred uh, being able to pull this off, even though he'd already made another movie. And so there was an emphasis on classical filmmaking, if you will, the idea that you shoot a master shot wide and then you go in close for coverage. And so the film is, I think Fred maybe, maybe said a little more conventionally shot than he would have liked maybe. So you do see a lot of wide shots starting the scenes, and I think he would have liked to have entered scenes maybe a little differently, a little less conventionally. But I think it all kinds of works, and I think Fred acknowledges that too, in terms of the classical nature of the monsters themselves, which I find it amusing that they pitched this idea around and Universal themselves were like, nah, not into it. But you can't copy our monsters because we got those on T-shirts and mugs and stuff. Like That was how they viewed the monsters at the time, just very ephemeral things that they owned, but not something they were interested in developing any new properties on. So ultimately they had to be careful about the monster design as to not be too much like the universals, like Count Dracula and Frankenstein are public domain creatures. The mummy is sort of a vague thing and it's very different than the mummies of the universal monsters. Um, but in terms of the wolf man, and Gilman, you know, Gilman is not the creature from the Black Lagoon. He's something else. Uh, but it's a really great design. And Fred is understandably proud of uh, all the monsters, but especially um, the Gilman monster. Uh, I think Duncan uh, Rigger, I can't, I, I can't pronounce that name right. He plays Count Dracula. He's very good in the film. And um, he's, as part of that documentary, um, they talk to a lot of really neat folks uh, they, they, in terms of the cast, they talked to him, they talked to Andre Gower, they talked to, um, Ashley Blank, who played the little girl, Fred Decker, uh, they talked to a whole bunch of other people too, I'll mention in a minute, but, um, there's some great stories on the set about 
how certain scenes were handled between Dracula and the little girl and stuff like that. I really enjoyed some of that stuff. But they also talked to outside folks like Adam Goldberg, Seth Green, Shane Black is not outside, he's inside. But he has, I think, maybe the most insightful things, he and Fred have the most insightful things to say in the documentary about the film and their intentions and things like that and their their view of how it failed and and stuff like that. But um, they also talked to like Heather Langkamp, Zach Galligan, um, Adam Green, Joe Lynch, uh, Chuck Russell, um, Diva Zappa, Graham Skipper, Jackson Stewart, um, Rebecca McKendry. Uh, it's a ton of folks. Eric Vespi is in this one too. Um, so yeah, it's a really neat sort of following the film itself, how it was not really well received in the eighties and how it had this resurgence in the 2000s. Uh, again, it was something I was aware of and pushing back in the VHS days and always kind of like, when are we going to get a DVD of this? And I don't know if we ever did. I feel like it went straight to Blu-ray. Maybe I'm wrong about that. No, it did get a DVD. Um, and how uh, there's a story about taking the, the remaining cast on tour, um, the actor that played the Horace character, who's clearly a, a real fan favorite in the movie. Um, he, um, Brent Chalum, he passed away in 1997. And so he's not part of it, but there's a nice tribute to him in the, in the documentary. And, um, it's just a really interesting take the, the idea that they, they took the cast on a tour uh, with some screenings circa 2007, I think maybe that's around when the DVD came out and how, you know, well received the tour was, how excited people were to see the movie and how they had seen it as this movie that maybe not as many people knew about when in fact a lot of people were knowing about it and excited about it. Anyway, a really like warm documentary. Um, but, but yeah, so you have those commentaries, then you have a full on, uh, sorry, you have another commentary with Decker and actors Andre Gower, Ryan Lambert, and Ashley Bank, which is good. Monster Squad Forever, which is like a five-part documentary, another making of. Then you have a conversation with Frankenstein. This is an archival, you know, Tom Noonan plays Frankenstein, which I love, by the way. Uh, and animated storyboard sequence, deleted scenes. Um, this looks really nice on 4K. I have no issues with the, the transfer at all. It's um, a new HDR Dolby Vision Master from a 4K scan of the original 35 millimeter uh, camera negative, and it looks really nice, as nice, again, as I've ever seen the film look, so I was really, really excited to get my hands on this one. Um, definitely highly recommended, uh, must pick up for fans and for people that you think might like this sort of movie. Um, great to show your kids to get them started on horror, I think, so very, very excited about both of these releases. Um, Silver Bullet and Monster Squad both now on 4K Silver Bullet from Screen Factory and Monster Squad from Kino Lorber uh, anyway that will do it for this round uh, thank you so much for listening and I will talk to you soon bye bye <laughs>